<laughs> Hi there, everybody. Uh, my name is Jay Frost. And so if you're new to this party, I want to welcome you, of course, to the Philanthropy Mastermind series, where we do our best to not only bring you great guests, but today actually a little water from Virginia. So we'll tell you more about that yes. later. Um, of course, this series is brought to you by our friends at DonorSearch. And we don't talk about donor search at all here, um, but I hope you will take a look at their services because they really do have a commitment to our sector in a way that's rare in the field. Uh, they've been fostering uh, not only great research on donors um, for 15 years this year, but since 2016, they've allowed us to have a platform for having conversations like the one you're about to encounter um, with, uh, I think, over 500 programs um, back to that date and a lot of fun. And today is very special because it's the first time we've had, we've had a chance to talk to someone whose name I'm sure you know, um, and, but uh, maybe not for all the work he does. Um, so, and I want to thank Tim for already starting us up in the chat. Thank you, Tim. The chat is a perfect place, if you look at the bottom of your page or perhaps to the left or right, where you can let us know that you're here. And we'd really appreciate knowing that. So just uh, go ahead and enter the chat if you would and say where you're from and uh, maybe which organization you're with. We would love to know. Uh, in addition, we also have the Q&A, which you'll find over uh, a few paces over. It's a perfect place to lodge your questions so we don't miss them later during the conversation. So please do utilize chat for conversation and Q&A for those questions and we'll get underway. And I wanna give it a brief introduction to our guest. Uh, even though I'm making him sit there so patiently while I do this. And that is, of course, Trent Stamp, who is the CEO of the Eisner Foundation, um, which, uh, if you don't know their work, uh, they identify, advocate for, and invest in high-quality innovative programs which unite multiple generations for the enrichment of our communities. They've been granting 8 to $10 million or so annually in L.A. and starting this year, also New York. Um, and um, their work is really about intergenerational work. I mean, you can see that on their board of directors, and I'm sure that our guests will tell you a bit, a bit about that later. Um, you may know, of course, Trent's uh, name from all that he's done in our sector over the years. He was the founding president of Charity Navigator before taking the helm at the Eisner Foundation. And today he's both known for his expertise in the charitable and philanthropic world generally, but also as one of the country's leading experts on healthy aging and intergenerational programs. So, so delighted to have uh, Trent right here in the Flat Bean Man's Spine series. Thank you so much, Trent, for, for hanging out today. Really appreciate it. Jay, it's my pleasure. Thank you for reading that, uh, that introduction, clearly written by my mother. <laughs> um, and, um, and I must just acknowledge up front that I am overly intimidated by the fact that I'm on a show called Philanthropy Masterminds. <laughs> um, if we could settle for philanthropy median minds or something to that effect, I would feel more comfortable, but I will do the best I can to to muddle through here. Well, if, if you're not honor. a mastermind, nobody is, Trent. No, I, no, I mean, you've a, been you've been it's at an this honor. Point. And, you know, I've admired your work for a long time from when we we talked back in the day. So um, thank you wow, for having thank me. you. Thank you. <laughs> That's kind of you to say. Uh, I mean, I've been obviously following all you've been doing forever, and it's not always been without controversy either. Meaning that when you take positions on things, including the work you're doing today, when you're talking about multiple generations, that's not without controversy either. But especially back to your work with Charity Navigator, you when you ask uh, people to go out and, and take a stand on whether an organization is performing well or not, you have to set up metrics for that. Obviously, some people are going to like it and some people don't. But before we even go there, I'd love to know just how you came to be involved in the Eisner Foundation. And if you could maybe give a little gloss for those who aren't very knowledgeable about Michael Eisner and the family. That would be very helpful, too. Sure. The Eisner Foundation was founded in 1996 by Michael and Jane Eisner um, and their three grown sons um, at the time. It is a, um, a private, independent uh, family foundation, which is a, a, a made up designation. But people like to throw it out there and, um, and, and argue that family foundation means something in some way or another. But um, we are a family foundation, as as was the Ford Foundation at one point and the Gates Foundation. Um, but um, it was founded in 1996. Michael was, of course, running the Walt Disney Corporation at the time and had um, um, received, you know, a great deal of wealth from from his successes there and wanted to find a way 
um, to give back to his community. So when the foundation was founded in 1996, they um, primarily made children's related grants, which made sense. It was in synergy with how they were earning their money as a family. Um, and it was more of a responsive grant maker in the sense that, you know, um, you know, if you wrote them a letter and you had a good story, um, you know, you had a chance of, of getting a grant. Um, but somewhere around then, in 2007, 2008, Michael had left Disney, and the family really wanted to professionalize their grant making. Grant making wanted to be more strategic, um, wanted to have you know a, a, a bigger outcome um, focus. Um, really try to figure out you know what kind of um, problems they could address in society and, and get. Um, more sophisticated and more strategic in, in their philanthropy. So um, they recruited me. I was found by the, the head hunting firm, Morrison Berger, which does a lot of work in, um, in the foundation and in the, uh, the nonprofit world. Um, and they convinced me to come out to Los Angeles um, and try my hand at the philanthropic side. I had never been involved in philanthropy. Uh, I had never worked my way up as a foundation officer or program officer or any of those types of things. Um, I had a relatively extensive background in the nonprofit world, um, having been vice president of Teach for America for a while um, and, you know, and then running Charity Navigator, um, which gave me a, a bird's eye view of 4,000 nonprofits nationwide and hopefully had a good idea of what worked and what didn't work. Um, but the Eisners were, uh, were interested in me coming out and running their foundation. They flew us out at uh, at Thanksgiving. We were living in Cornwall, New York, um, and uh, had about three feet of snow in our driveway, and uh, and flew us out at uh, at Thanksgiving. And with my six year old and my four year old at the time, put us up in Santa Monica. And my kids were swimming in the pool on Thanksgiving Day, asking me, Dad, why on earth don't we live here all the time? Um, <laughs> So the opportunity was good. We decided to pursue it um, and give it a run. We do not live at a hotel in Santa Monica. In fact, we don't have a pool, so my kids didn't swim again. Um, but uh, but it's been a, a lovely place to raise my family and uh, and to have this opportunity to lead this uh, this important foundation. Yeah, and the people do talk a lot about the allure of working in grant making. Um, but that's at a distance. You've been living it and breathing it and obviously enjoying it because you've been having a lot of impact there. But what kind of transition was that to go from this world where you're looking, as you say, bird's eye view of all these charities and saying, you know, essentially yes or no uh, about how well, how effective they're being and then um, working with something that's that's not reviewed in that same way and is looking at the charities and thinking, well, maybe I will and maybe I won't support it. What kind of change was that for you? I mean, it was a legitimate um, and, and and major change. I mean, you know, I am I am a huge advocate for Charity Navigator and the work that we did there. And I think it was an important service that we brought um, to a sector that was resistant to have any sort of external evaluation being done by it, despite the fact that every other industry had an external evaluator um, coming in and, and weighing in on their operations. And the charity world was was really adamant that they not be evaluated on any way whatsoever. And we can talk as much as you want about whether we evaluated them on the right things or not, but I do think that it was important to bring that type of third-party evaluation to the nonprofit sector. But that being said, what we were doing um, as an evaluation tool at Charity Navigator was based solely on public documents, public records, whatever we could get our hands on and being done from 30,000 feet. Um, and we were trying to create a tool that was helpful for, you know, my mom or your wife or somebody who was waiting in who had given $50 to an animal shelter. Um, and then we all know what happens when you give $50 to one animal shelter. They realize they're not going to roll you up into a bigger donor. So they sell your name to 500 other animal related shelters. And the next thing you know, you've got 500 envelopes with scalded dogs and cute puppies and, you know, little kittens on there. And you have no idea what to do. Um, and so, you know, my mom would throw her hands up in the air and say, I want to help with these dogs or these puppies, but, you know, I, I don't have any idea what to do. And so we were trying to create a tool for her mm -hmm. from her kitchen while she's making dinner. You know, she can wade in and try to figure out, is this organization going to spend my money in a way that's responsible? Am I going to not regret this gift in a few years? 
That's not the kind of evaluation you can do when you're running a large philanthropy and a large philanthropy with a living donor, um, where you know we a are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars um, in an organization. Um, so it's important that we get it right um, in some way or another. We also have an influential name on the door, so we get to traffic in that in the sense that when I make a gift, it it carries a little bit more weight than if the John Doe Foundation makes a gift. People look around and go, oh, Eisner made a gift. Um, we know him. We know of him. We respect him. We know the name in the community. And, you know, therefore, they're more likely to follow it in some way or another. They're more likely to make the same type of gift. And then lastly, and this is, I'm not going to pretend this isn't a factor, um, you know, if we do something stupid, we end up on the front page of the LA Times. Um, it doesn't happen for the John Doe Foundation. Um, you know, we have a big name in a big entertainment city. And if we don't make a good gift for whatever reason, it becomes news. So we have to get this right. We have to wade in. We have to trust our metrics. We have to trust our site visits. We have to have a process. We have to wear organizations out on the front end. Um, and, you know, and I think that's relevant and it's different than what we were doing at Charity Navigator. That's that's fascinating on so many levels, because it, it, as you're saying, if you're the person who's writing the check for fifty dollars or whatever it is, um, you have we've all needed some way to figure out which which charity best suits our our interests and, and is doing the work right according to our own uh, measures. Um, and so Charity Navigator and others uh, have emerged over the last couple of decades to try and, and uh, solve that riddle. But within a, a large organization or within any kind of institutional philanthropic framework, it's a different set of considerations. And you just mentioned two earlier. One is um, reputation and another one is family. So uh, just scanning through even the website just today, just to make sure I was ready to talk to you. Um, it, it looks like you've got at least three generations on the board. Is that right? We have two generations as formal board members. Mm -hmm. um, we have Michael and Jane Eisner and their three grown sons. Um, but they have three wives who serve as advisors. Um, and then there are nine grandchildren in the pipeline who are coming through. Um, and so we're trying to figure out exactly what their role is, um, exactly, you know, when they get dealt in. Um, so they are at this point kind of informal advisors, um, but there's no doubt that this will become an intergenerational philanthropy, not only in what we invest in, but in the way that we, um, we make those investing decisions. So, um, so right now we have only two generations on our board, but we have a third waiting in the wings. Right. I, I can imagine it, without being specific about the Eisner family, because that's that's a confidence uh, that you share with them. Um, what is it like to work with uh, a family foundation, meaning if it really the family part of that? Um, and then secondly, when you're working across generations, the, um, how do you uh, make sure that everybody's needs and interests are being met? Yeah, um, I mean, the funny thing about working for a family foundation, however that's defined, right. um, is that, you know, when the board meeting is over, um, they don't stop being a family. Um, you know, they, they continue to interact with each other. And, you know, I only get them for a few hours at a time. And then I leave and I step out and I'm not part of that particular family anymore. Um, you know, they're very kind to me. They've been very gracious. Um, but my name is not Eisner. Um, so I'm, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not anticipating um, any sort of large deaths uh, other than the, uh, the the very fine compensation that I received for running the, the foundation. But, but I'm not in line for anything um, larger than that. So, you know, you have to, you have to remember to, to, to come and go as appropriate um, and to understand that there are 50 years, um, you know, when it comes to the children that are involved um, of, of past histories and, you know, and past relationships and past decisions. 
and they all come into the to into the room. You don't have five independent actors um, at a board meeting. You have a little ecosystem with you know mother issues and father issues and children issues and you know and relationships and the whole thing. And I think they've been an unbelievably generous and gracious family, and they worked well together, and they're very strategic. Um, but it's a family, and you know it's just one of those things that you know you, that you need to navigate and be appropriate of and take into account and understand that there are things that are underlying in the room that I'm just not privy to and it's not my role to be privy to and I need to make the best decisions um, without you know without overstepping but understanding that you know this isn't you know like you know when you run the Ford Foundation and you've got you know 30 masters of industry coming in from their each you know uh, independent companies. These are five people who are going to gather together for Thanksgiving. Um, yeah. And so while you want to professionalize the, the grant making as much as possible, you do have to take into account that it is a family and there are family interests. And, and we work for uh, we work for that particular family and they are thankfully um, alive and well. The the, uh, the intergenerational aspect of that, um, there are a lot of levels to that conversation too. One of them just has to do with working with, as you said, people who are coming in, uh, this kind of the third generation. Um, you've also got the founders, you've got their children. And then there's probably some kind of legacy that people have in mind. Um, it might be their own parents that are no longer there, their grandparents, the influence that they've had on them. And that must be influencing both the work that you're doing within the Eisner Foundation, meaning the board, but also your work. But but it it must be a factor as you think about philanthropy now because people are living longer, and one of the questions is how do we get even if families that love one another and like to get together for Thanksgiving, uh, there are always going to be differences in how we view the world even if our values are aligned. You know we might think it's more important to do something for impact, and somebody else says no no I want to invest like the old endowment debate. You know, I, I love endowments. I hate endowments. You could have two people with the same amount of money in the same age who disagree on that. So when it comes to this inter intergenerational aspect, what what's your biggest you know lesson learned over the years dealing with that in a practical way with this family? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that we're doing right now is we're talking a lot about donor intent. Um, and we want to talk about it in the moment. Um, because Michael and Jane, um, you know, the, um, the founders of this foundation, um, you know, they're older, but they're, they're extremely vibrant and they have a lot to give at this point. And, and they still want to be, um, involved in, in the operations of the foundation. And so what we want to do is make sure that we create a blueprint, um, and it may not even be for me as the CEO. I may be long gone by then too. Um, but we want to make sure that we we're we're taking steps to understand um, what exactly mattered to the founders, um, what exactly they wanted out of the foundation, and what exactly it should look like in in ten, twenty, thirty, two hundred years. Um, one of the things that we we landed on was that they didn't want to spend down. Um, we had we had some some very serious conversations, and those are serious conversations um, about the kind of impact we could have if we spent the money um, strategically in the next three, five, seven, ten years, um, so that the foundation would would sunset like many others have done. Um, and, and our particular family decided that they didn't want to do that. Um, that they wanted to have longevity um, and they wanted to imbue a philanthropic legacy, not only to the next generation, but to the generation after that. Um, and so we're, we're talking about, okay, what does that look like then? Because, you know, you can unravel that quickly mm -hmm. if you, if you so chose, you know, with the next, with the next board, we know full well that there's nobody that holds standing on the other side that's ever going to be able to come in and say, you know, Michael Eisner didn't want you to spend down. Um, and, you know, if the current board at that point wants to spend down and they have the votes, it's going to spend down. Um, it's just it's just the way it works. Um, so um, so we're really in in very serious conversations about, you know, what does this look like in the long run? And 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 the big takeaway that the family has insisted on is they wanted to remain one foundation. 
um, and they want to make, remain one foundation committed on these types of intergenerational programs that bring people together, that unite people. And so we're, we're you know, it's it's very meta in the sense that we're we're trying to run our foundation in a way that we want the world to look like um, outside the foundation. And so it's all about this passing down of wisdom and mentoring and tutoring and and um, and ensuring that we're creating an environment where two generations, if not three generations, can work together for the betterment of society, and in our case, the betterment of our foundation. So um, we're, we're kind of a little test lab for what we want to have happen with our grant making at our own foundation management level. Well, so why is that important, that intergenerational work in the community? Why, why should we care? Why should we care about what the work that we do? I'm not about the Eisner Foundation, but about this general concept. Why is it important that we have this intergenerational focus? What's what's the the chief value of that? How can it help us? Yeah, well, I don't know if you've noticed lately, but we're not really getting along real well in this country. Uh, there's there seem to be um, some relatively large divisions among uh, races and socioeconomic status and sexual orientation and. Um, rural versus urban, and I, I could go on all day long, um, political parties, obviously. Um, we have found that there is um, consensus that one of the ways we can bring people together, even with all those other differences that are out there, is across age. Um, this, this concept of generativity is real, um, and it is the only um, kind of cohort that can be at times divisive where one group will become the other one if we play our cards right. Um, it just doesn't happen in, in, in other sectors. Uh, so we have found that by creating a shared vision, by, by bringing people together and getting them to work together for the betterment of their community and to see each other as resources and assets and not just um, as recipients of services, um, the impact that we can create is large. You know, we we came to this organically in the sense that we were funding children's programs and we were funding six seniors programs and they were completely separate. We had two separate grant pools at our foundation and 20 percent of our funding went towards seniors at risk and 80 percent went towards kids at risk. Um, and we found over time that the organizations that were doing the best, that were having the highest impact, the most measurable results were those that were intergenerational. They were serving those two groups together at the same time, seeing each other as resources, seeing each other as assets, using seniors to work with at-risk kids, using kids to address homebound seniors, whatever it was, you know, the whole thing, we found that they were actually more effective. A lot of them weren't even trying to be intergenerational. That wasn't a stated goal. They were trying to raise third graders reading scores in South LA, and they found that the best way that they could raise those third grade reading scores in South LA was by bringing in a cohort of qualified, competent, viable, valuable volunteers who were seniors. Um, and when they did that, the kids test scores skyrocketed, the seniors um, actually had increased health outcomes um, because they had purpose in their lives and they knew that there was someone else who was dependent on them. Um, and in the community, we saw that there was less violence, um, less at-risk behaviors, and people were starting to come together in a little bit. The goal was just to raise some reading scores for some kids who had been left behind. But by making these intergenerational programs, they were creating this threefold in outcomes for the community, and we wanted to be a part of that. So we said, this is what we're going to do. We're just going to fund nothing but intergenerational programs. First, we did it in Los Angeles. We've since added New York City as a um, as a focus also. But everything we fund has to have an intergenerational lens to it. It doesn't matter whether it's advocating for women's rights or cleaning up the environment or working in the schools or transforming our workforce. It doesn't matter. As long as you're working in a high quality way intergenerationally, we want to hear about it. Does that make it any more difficult? <clears throat> I mean, for example, if if there are nonprofits out there and they they want money because they all do, um, and they want to apply for support, uh, does it make it more challenging to find the right nonprofits who can provide an intergenerational lens, or for nonprofits that are trying to do better work and are open to that, but they don't they haven't established that kind of program as yet? Um, 
it doesn't make it more difficult. And to me, it, it just creates more opportunity. Um, so, you know, we, we think it works. And after having done it for six, seven years, we have a deep bench of organizations that we have worked with that have demonstrated records of success. Um, so if you're working in one of those two communities and you either haven't incorporated an intergenerational lens or you don't know how, um, you should contact us and we'll connect you with some organizations that have done it. Um, and you can learn from their successes and failures. Um, but, um, but no, we, we, we think that, uh, you know, we believe the, the motto of foster grandparents, which is every dollar spent twice. Um, you know, it's it's efficient and it's effective. And in our case, we believe um, it's necessary and not just nice. Yeah. I, and that's the reason I wanted to ask you that question, because I was curious how people have responded. if They've come up to the challenge, but it also sounds like you're not only providing a model in L.A. and New York now, but um, but by having these organizations which have been successful, that's a model then for other organizations to follow. What about for grant makers? You mentioned earlier that um, having a name like Eisner associated with the foundation does mean that you get attention. You, you might be on the front page, page of a paper, hopefully always for good reasons, but just people pay attention versus uh, a, you know, a less well-known name. So as a result of this focus and having that name, does it also uh, inspire, attract um, other foundations to try this as a model, intergenerational grant making? We think so. Um, and, you know, um, you know, you know the motto better than anyone. If you've talked to one foundation, you've talked to one foundation. <laughs> um, and so, uh, <laughs> you know, er every foundation is reluctant to say that they're following someone else's work um, in any way whatsoever. And I don't know if it's a byproduct of it was just um, a demographic change that was happening. Um, but when we decided to do this six, seven years ago, we were clearly the only foundation that was primarily working intergenerationally. Mm -hmm. um, there are several that have now come in and there are several that have added um, a focus. And there are several who have just said, we're open to hearing more about what's going on here. So, um, I, you know, and it may just be a byproduct of there are a lot of good nonprofits out there that are doing it. Um, but, um, but we have found that, you know, um, it's, it's slow when you're trying to build a movement and you're in the movement. Um, you know, you want it to go quicker. You want everybody to stand up and say, oh my God, those guys out at Eisner are so smart. Why don't we do what they're doing? Um, but you know, it doesn't happen as, as quickly as you'd hope. And, you know, we try to be humble in it and, uh, and provide as much technical assistance to others as we possibly can if they're interested, um, knowing full well that, uh, that I don't want anybody to tell me how to run the foundation that I'm lucky enough to, to run um, any more than I want to prescribe what someone else should do with their foundation. So, Sure, sure. Uh, well, it, uh, of course, people have been, at least on the surface level, open to lots of different ways of doing things, especially the last two and a half, three years, um, as we've been living through the pandemic, but also, uh, uh, you know, social justice, racial justice movement, lots of other things have happened. Um, and I'm wondering how those influences may have influenced all of you at the foundation, but how you've also seen them influence other other grant makers. In terms of what has changed in the last couple of yeah. years, essentially. Yeah. Um, I, I think a few things. I mean, I think I think one of the things that happened, um, we certainly saw it at our foundation, is I think people backed away from this um, demand for data um, out the wazoo. Um, you know, it, it became the in vogue thing of I need every piece of data. I need every measurable objective you can possibly give me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we saw that when, you know, when crisis happened, um, a lot of us had to back away a little bit and say, I know you don't have um, extensive data on the work that you're doing here, but I trust you and you're working in the sector and people are literally dying. So I'm going to go ahead and make a gift and hope that you got this right. And you know what happened, Jay, is a lot of us got it right. Um, it's going to be okay. Um, I'm not saying we, we abandon our quest for data, um, mm -hmm. but if you find good partners and you trust them, um, I think in most cases, the results are going to be pretty good. So I think I think we we backed away a little bit um, from from our demand for for data. Um, I think there was a little bit of a humbling on the philanthropic side, a little bit of an acknowledgement that um, 
we're not the drivers of social change. The nonprofits are going to be the drivers of that social change. Um, and we need to kind of make sure we're, we're keeping them front and center. Um, you know, when, 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 when George Floyd was murdered and, and, you know, people in Los Angeles where I work were protesting in the streets, um, I can write all the checks I want, but it doesn't do anything unless, you know, I find, you know, the right partner at the right end who can do the right thing to, to try to, you know, to promote racial justice and um, alleviate some pain and, and help people. So I, I do think that maybe those of us in the, in the philanthropic world whose heads tend to get a little bigger every once in a while, because everybody just tells you how smart you are um, and how wonderful you are. Maybe there was a little bit of a humbling that we could, um, we could step back and recognize that we're not the true heroes in this story and we're not any smarter than anybody else. Um, I do think that perhaps the stakes were galvanized a little bit. Um, we realized that this is important. Um, you know, when, when things are just swimmingly going along and, you know, and you can make all the gifts you want to, you know, endow the lacrosse team at the college you went to um that's all fine and good but when you know more americans are dying than have done so since world war ii you know um i think you realize this is pretty important stuff and i i have a unique opportunity to do um important things so maybe i should uh maybe i should step this up a little bit um and then i think the last thing that that you know, at least that's specific to our work, um, is we spent a fair deal of time before the pandemic talking about um, kind of the deleterious effects of loneliness um, on people. Um, you know, the, the statistic that's trotted out all the time is that being lonely is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day for your long-term health prospects. Wow. Um, and, you know, it's easy to just kind of go, yeah, 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 whatever. But we have a lot of data showing that when people are lonely and people are socially isolated, um, bad things happen, um, not only to them, but to society as a whole. And I think people realize that during COVID um, because I think we were all lonely. Um, and all of a sudden it got real when you realize that it wasn't just um you know seniors in you know in tenements up in new york city or something that were you know hidden behind their their walls that you know weren't being visited but it was just you um and you saw you know what the long term impacts were on your health and your psyche and your mental health and your relationships um when you were lonely and so for us i think it was kind of a good thing cuz it reminded people um or told people for the first time that that being lonely and being locked away and not having social connection can really be a negative thing, not only for you, but for your community as a whole and our and our nation as a whole, if not our world. Um, and so, you know, people started to there be more attraction for how do we fund things that bring people together? Um, how do we get people out of their houses? How do we connect with them through technology? Um, and how do we try to find ways to unite our communities? Because that seems like a good thing um, so that we don't suffer the uh, the consequences that we suffered from, from being alone during COVID. When you were talking about this, it struck me that you said uh, philanthropists aren't necessarily, or the institutional donors aren't necessarily the uh, the agents of change, that, but they can help facilitate it. Obviously, they have resources and they care and they have ways of evaluating things. But that that the leadership would have to come from the nonprofits themselves. But there's been this other kind of force, you know, for people who have said nonprofits haven't been fast enough. They they, they aren't they aren't rising to the occasion. Look at all these problems that exist and they keep doing the same things. Or um, it, it, I'm wondering. Have you seen nonprofits also rise to the occasion, or are there other forces that are leading all of us to come together and work together on these issues? Yeah, I, mean, I think the answer is both. To, to is yes to both of your questions. I, I've seen remarkable nonprofits do remarkable work, um, and not just since COVID started. I mean, I'm a huge advocate for for nonprofits in this country. I mean, we've spent um 40 years in this country running on smaller government um you know ever since ronald reagan showed up and and you know and said you know we need to get rid of our government um you know every everybody goes to the the, the voting box and, and says smaller government smaller government smaller government 
Well, the services that they provided don't, the need for those services don't go away. Um, so our nonprofits have been providing those services for the, for the most part for the last 40 years, um, oftentimes with government funding, which just makes the whole argument, um, you know, uh, false and silly, uh, um, you know, but um, they're doing the work. So I, I, I'm a huge advocate for nonprofits, one of my one of my pet peeves is is folks who work in the for profit sector who who come in and say, you know, I'm just going to provide some business principles to this nonprofit and I'm going to turn it around in in no time. Um, you know, you're a 27 year old woman running a, a battered women's shelter in Long Beach, California, making sixty six thousand dollars a year, um, dependent on you know your volunteer base and them showing up to literally provide life and death services for these people. Um, you don't need some sort of rich millionaire coming in and telling you that they're going to run it more like they ran their consulting company. Um, I think she could teach that consulting company a lot of things about business principles and business ideals. So I, I'm not a fan of that. And I'm a fan of the nonprofit sector, although, you know, I've been at odds with with many members of it for the last 25 years. And, and that's all perfectly fine. But it comes from a position of love. I think nonprofits are propping up this country and, and, and keeping a lot of people um, from falling into um to bad consequences and, and providing a safety net for them. So um so so yes is the answer to that. I really I really do believe um that nonprofits have stepped up. Are they perfect? Of course not. They're run by human beings under difficult circumstances and you know it's hard to react on a dime when when things are are lousy and and you're being scared and you know let's say you run an after school program on March of 2020 and all of a sudden somebody comes in and says you can't provide after school services to these kids in person, um, but we want you to provide high quality after school care somehow figure it out. Um, and then walked away and they didn't give you another dime to do the services. Um, so, you know, was it bumpy? Sure. Um, but so was me running my foundation and you running your business and, you know, everything else in this country when you're making it up on the fly. But, you know, but I, I'm, I am a fan of nonprofits and I think there's some great leadership there and there's some good folks doing good things. Um, and I think we need to support them as a society. Can we all do more, which I think was the back end of your question. Can we all come together? Can we get out of our silos, you know, whatever the cliche is and can we, you know, figure out ways for, for government and business and nonprofits and philanthropies and private individuals to work together? Absolutely. Um, so, so let's do that because the stakes are high. Um, and uh, and people's lives are literally dependent on it. Well, it sounds like you think that people are open to that too, which is important. Um, maybe one way to think about that is, of course, the way we build this, which is talking about something that, in fact, Tim asked about in the questions, which is what are the funders looking to uh, to from nonprofits? It's, you know, what are, what kinds of things do they want to fund? But also, maybe more importantly, what you know, what what kind of partnerships are they looking for? So um, as you as you encounter that now daily, what what are the th some of the things that you're seeing maybe emerging, especially as we come out hopefully closer to the end of this particular pandemic? Um, what are funders looking to do, and who are their ideal partners to do it? Well, our partners are all nonprofits. Um, we, we're in the bag. Um, you know, we think that that nonprofits are uniquely positioned to provide high quality services. Um, the barrier to this success is usually just funding. Um, so we think, you know, that until we dump a whole lot more money into the sector, um, we don't really have the right to say this is how you should do it better. Um, because just about every nonprofit that I know is currently underfunded in some way or another. And if you went in, and um, I dare you to walk into the executive director or CEO of a nonprofit and say, if I doubled your budget, what would you do with it? I guarantee you they have a list in their drawer somewhere, or since they're smarter than I am and younger than I am, probably on their computer somewhere. Um, it's it's not that they they don't have big aspirations and big vision. Um, they just don't have the funding um, in most cases. Um, and so um, so I do think that, you know, that I'm really worried about trends showing individual giving declining. Uh, right. I'm really worried about, you know, um, the folks that really prop up the nonprofit sector, um, deciding to, to do other things with their money. Um, and so I, I would advocate that people find ways um, to invest in their nonprofits in their community that do whatever it is that they want to do, because I do think that it's a good um, it's a good vehicle for uh, for your investment in your future in your community is to is to give regularly to to nonprofit organizations. Um, 
in terms of what we're looking for, I mean, I you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a little bit of a hypocrite here because I I want to acknowledge that up front I said um, that we're looking for organizations who work intergenerationally. So you know, um, so that's prescriptive on our part, right? I mean, we've said that if you don't work intergenerationally, you're not going to get our funding. We've also said that if you don't work in Los Angeles or New York City, you're not going to get our funding. So we have put barriers up and said, you know. You have to jump through these two particular hoops to have a chance at the Eisner Foundation for funding. From there, I don't want to tell you a word. Um, I want you to come in and tell me what the problem is and how you're going to address it and why you're the right person to do it. Um, we have an open application process at the Eisner Foundation. We don't ever want to get to the point where we're just inviting people or we're doing the work and the whole thing. If you have a great idea, we want to hear about it. Um, it makes things a little harder for my program officer, you know, because stuff comes flying in the door pretty, pretty often. And we have to say no an awful lot because we just don't have the funding um, right. to support everything. But we want you to be able to tell us um, where you're going and why we would be silly to not want to be a part of it. Because we can't do anything without good nonprofit partners. And so we want nonprofits to come in and basically tell us that if we don't invest in them, it's going to look bad for us um, because we're not going to make the right decision because they're cooking up something pretty cool and we should want to be a part of it. So I want you to be driving the car. I want you to be driving the bus, you know, put the sign up out in front saying this is where this bus goes. Would the Eisner Foundation like to get on this bus um, rather than me jumping in and telling you I need you to go left, do right, do the whole thing. Um, let's go in this direction. We only make general operating grants. So while we, we while we wear you out on the front end um, in terms of, you know, um, our vetting and our analysis and the documents we require, and we don't make a gift without a site visit, um, any of those types of things. But once we do that, um, we don't tell you how we want you to spend the money during the time of your grant period, because you know better than we do. Oh, uh, well, that's that's huge. And that that's, you know, what we might be accused of bearing the lead. The idea of providing general operating support is amazing. So um, because that's, been doing that's it for 15 years, Jay. we've since the day since the day I walked in the door, every right. gift that we have made has been a general operating grant. But that does make you somewhat unique as a foundation, doesn't it? I mean, um, again, you know, you talk to one foundation, you talk to one foundation. Sure. I, I, I don't I don't have any idea. I mean, it's funny when I go to, you know, conferences, you know, and people talk about how I was the, you know, the the charity navigator guy who destroyed the nonprofit sector by insisting on that they spend a certain amount of money on programs. Um, nobody ever says, and yet he's given away a hundred million dollars in the last 10 years, um, exclusively for general operating. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, it's it's perfectly fine um you know it's not why we do the work that we do but we do feel that uh that organizations um just know better than we do on how to best run their organization i'll tell you this this is a, a quick story which is when i came to la the very first summer to take over the eisner foundation and i went around and i met with all the nonprofits that i could find just whatever past grantees prospective grantees, whatever, a listening tour, um, selfishly for my own purposes, to try to learn about the community and learn um, what worked, what didn't work. I was coming from New York, um, and I just wanted to identify the needs. And, and I met with executive directors, um, and I told them essentially what I just told you, which is, you know, we're going to wear you out on the front end. I'm the charity navigator guy. I got a living donor. This is very important. We're going to make sure we get this gift right. But then when I give it to you, I'm not going to tell you what to do with it. If, if you need to buy a copy machine to do your work better, buy the stupid copy machine. All right. I must be redundant and repeating myself regularly because I apparently gave the same speech over and over again. At the end of my first year, when we got our final reports from people, I had bought six copy machines. Uh, <laughs> Organizations just ran out and went, oh, my God, this sucker is going to pay for a copy machine. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, they sent back their reports. And I, I, then I was afraid that we were going to be the copy machine foundation. Uh, so I, I don't I say you spend the money on whatever you think is best for you to advance your organization and to have high quality successes. I then don't suggest they buy anything in particular. No copy machines, no coffee pots, no nothing. They make those decisions. So but we were we were we were this close to being the copy machine foundation uh I, I have to ask you the the dumbest question of all time but it's because i know that with the people in this room and those who watch it afterwards some will still have these questions about 
Okay, how can I learn what it is that I should do? How do I approach the foundation, especially if they say does not, and I don't mean the Eisner Foundation, but generally, um, if it says do not accept unsolicited uh, proposals, you know, what are the, if you were going to give just general operating principles for uh, thinking about reaching out for institutional support, what are the two or three things that you'd recommend that people do so they do it right? I, I mean, the first one that just blows my mind is you, you have to know every word on their website. Um, read it all. Read their requirements. If they say, you know, in our case, we only fund in Los Angeles County and New York City, and then you're in Omaha and you send me a letter saying, can I have funding? No, you can't. Um, but, you know, it's just the way it works. Um, you know, and it just blows my mind how often we get people who just didn't read the website. They just didn't understand. And it, sometimes it goes the other way, which is I find people saying, you know, well, we didn't apply because, you know, I don't know you personally and we were never getting an invitation. And mm -hmm. I say, you read paragraph six that said, you don't have to know me personally and you don't get an invitation and I just want you to apply. And they go, really? <laughs> right. You know, I mean, whatever get an, <laughs> get an intern get a college student get your teenager i don't care read every <laughs> single word that they have to offer on their own website and then make a determination from there um you know and then the other this just sounds silly this is this is just trite and idealistic and the whole thing just go do good work i think foundations will find you i really do um i think that if you're out in the community and you have transformative effects on people people talk about it uh, all of us foundation every time i meet when in our secret cabal with other foundation leaders in our rooms with our you know um oak panels and our marble tables and our <laughs> Manhattans or whatever it is that we're supposedly doing in our secret society. The first question I always get from one of my peers is, what are you funding that you really like? What's good? Um, you know, what's out there? Tell me about somebody who's doing something interesting. Um, you know, and, it's, and I'm, I'm amazed. And, you know, I like to talk about it. I go, oh, well, let me tell you about this organization that's in, you know, East LA that's working intergenerationally, but it'll appeal to you because they have high quality health outcomes for seniors and the whole thing. And boom, now we're off to the races. Um, and that's, you know, the, the executive directors think they had to network, they had to get to us. I, I really just believe that if you do really good work, um you know people will find you and that uh, doesn't mean, it doesn't mean you have to hire a publicist or be on social media <laughs> it just means go do good work um <laughs> and trust the funding community you need to be active and you need to write your lois and you need to you know research and mine and do all those types of things but you know when you're making a decision on tuesday morning of you know how do i you know divide my resources is it you know make a TikTok about you know our you know our organization or is it just provide high quality services and feed some more people choose the latter and and trust that we'll find out about you it, it you know you clearly are as juiced up about what you're doing now as you've ever been about anything you've done uh, but what but there's something that fuels you to do whatever is coming next because it's not like this this isn't a static thing uh the world has changed a lot in the period of time that you've been with this foundation. What are you looking forward that's really exciting you as you look on the other end of the work that you've been doing right now? Like, what do you imagine the foundation funding and you pursuing in the next decade? Well, I think we're at the in infancy of this of this intergenerational movement, so I'm I'm really looking forward to it. You know, we have we have more people in this country, you know, over the age of sixty than we do under the age of eighteen for the first time ever. Um, it's not it's not going to change anytime soon um it's it's an explosion those of us who work in aging have been told not to use the the phrase silver tsunami um because a tsunami is something bad um but i think that's a super cool term so i continue to use it which just angers people um it's it's a benevolent silver tsunami um uh, and so you know america's just getting older and older and we can figure out um how to best warehouse those folks or we can figure out how to best utilize those folks and i want to be on the side of seeing most seniors there are of course vulnerable people out there um, but most seniors as assets and resources and as people who can provide so much to our community one of the things that made me sad during covid was that we 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 locked away our seniors um and we did it for their own good right we said you know you're you're the ones who will be most likely to get sick and and to die and of course that was right 
but we treated them all as one particular population and said, get out of the way. Um, when in reality, we were facing the biggest crisis of my lifetime. Um, and it really would have been nice to have a lot of those people who had a lot of wisdom and a lot of resources and a lot of talent who could have helped us during what was the scariest time in my lifetime. Um, and so I, I just want to be part of this movement to try to figure out how do we get seniors involved um, in our communities, in our raising our children and serving as mentors, as tutors, back in the workforce when they want to work? Um, and how do we, you know, how do we harness the power of older adults um, in this country? Because I just think that, um, you know, it's necessary. We'll just leave it at that. It's the, you know, the, the other side is, is, is too negative to even comprehend. So let's figure it out because we can do good things together. I don't know how we could do better than that. Uh, Trent, thank you so much uh, for all of that, especially that wide lens at the end. Really appreciated everything you do, but also taking some time to talk with us today. Um, uh, if people want to learn more about the foundation, again, I know that they should be able to Google it, but would you mind sharing how they could learn more and, or interact with you if that's appropriate? Sure, they can go to eisnerfoundation.org. Um, and um, I believe all of our contact information is there and we are open and available and um, we want to help. And, you know, if you're in L.A. and you want to stop by, give me a call. Um, but uh, but other than that, we're, we're not hard to find. We, we feel we have an obligation to be out there and to uh, to be part of the community, however that's defined. So just go to EisnerFoundation.org um, and, uh, and and we'll be there. Thank you so much, Trent. Really do appreciate it. And uh, I want to thank everybody also for being here for part of this conversation. You didn't have many questions because I think he was providing so much information. But as you saw, the door is open. And since a lot of people in our sector feel like the door is shut, even maybe when it isn't, um, that's an invitation I hope you'll take to heart, starting with reading the website, as Anonymous said earlier. Uh, so please do that. And if you want to take a little read of something, you may want to take a read of the donor search website as well, which you can do at donorsearch.net. And under the resources tab, you'll find listings of all the sessions we have coming up next week. We have four more next week alone. They're not all with people like Trent, but they are great people um, from the US and across the pond. Lots of great content. You're going to want to sit in on some of the, or all of those sessions so you can learn all about it there. If you have any questions about it, you can reach out to donor search directly through the website. You can sign up on the list there, or you can reach out to me. My name is Jay Frost, and you can reach me at jay at donorsearch.net or wherever you like to uh, paramble the internet. You can find me pretty easily. Um, so until next time, uh, take care, stay healthy out there, and um, gain some wisdom from the seniors in your world, because uh, that was a pretty profound message we just got. Thank you, Trent. Appreciate you. Thanks, Jay. It was a pleasure. It was my honor. Take care, everybody.